Welcome back to the Pin Pals Podcast, the podcast about enamel pins and the people and culture behind them. I'm your host, Eric, from Warrior Pins, and that is my puppy, Ollie, playing with Gumby in the background. I apologize if you can hear that squeak, but we're going to keep it live, baby. If this is the first time you're tuning in to the podcast, welcome. Glad you can be here. You're going to learn a lot. You're going to love it here. Make sure you have a dedicated notes section on your phone or bust out a notebook. You're going to learn a lot of fun stuff, especially in today's episode. If you're one of the OGs who have been here since day one, I appreciate you. This is episode 36, so uh, you've been along for the ride, and just I appreciate you through everything. It's awesome that you're still tuning in. Uh, Shout out to my Buy Me A Coffee crew for always holding it down. You know who you are. I'm excited for our virtual happy hour, which is happening tonight. Uh, The date would be September 22nd, Thursday. Happy hours usually happen on a Thursday. I try and do them bi-regularly at the very least. And, uh, you know, we just set aside an hour and uh, we talk shop. We talk pins. We talk what's going on. You know, we shoot the shit. It's a lot of fun. Uh, You can join in on that fun by becoming a monthly or yearly supporter on my Buy Me A Coffee page. It's buymeacoffee.com slash podcast. The link will be in the show notes, but it's a lot of fun. And, you know, if you're just looking to connect with other pin makers and just have a good time and build, a, build some friendships, build some relations, uh, be part of this really cool, fun pin community, uh, I highly encourage you to do so. It's a lot of fun. Again, the link will be in the show notes. So today's episode, I chat with Mauricio from Rockin' Pins. Um, apologize for the spanish heavy accent um but you know i'm trying to practice it so i figured i'd uh, flex a little bit on you guys um but anyway he's been in the pin game for a while so he brings a ton of knowledge to the table more specifically about licensing and i know that's always been a topic of discussion uh either in the dms or in the discord server uh rockin pins has a license to create all sorts of pins from gumby and betty boop uh popeye all the way to like richard Pryor and david bowie like he's established these relationships and the the way that he just goes about networking is awesome and uh, he gets really transparent and he talks about all that stuff so it's fascinating so i definitely urge you guys to pay attention closely you know like i said if you have uh, any of your notebooks or anything like that boom bust them out because you're gonna need them Uh, Mauricio also has a passion for cartoons, more specifically, like the classic uh, Flesher, 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 I hope I'm saying that right, Flesher Studios, they're the ones that make uh, Betty Boop, and um, he's just, you know, he's just a dude trying to keep the cartoons alive, the art of the cartoons alive, and I love it, I love, I'm just, I'm so attracted to people who are very passionate about the things that they love and uh you hear that all over this episode and it's awesome um i think you're in for a good time so without further ado enjoy my conversation with my pin pal rockin pins thanks again um i appreciate it you know i I think what you're doing is cool giving people their their time and highlighting what they do and what i notice is yeah it's a lot of different niche sort of you know they have their different avenues you know you got your ninja turtles and i see some people go with like simpsons or all this sort of stuff and it's and it's great i think all these different properties uh you know they their fan base is what keeps them alive. So to see, you know, now these fans are starting to branch out and kind of, Hey, you know, I'm not getting the right merch <clears throat> from the r- official stuff. So I'll just like do it myself. And that's funny enough. That's kind of where I'm coming from too. I mean, there's a lot of bands that I grew up loving that didn't have, you know, the money like the Beatles or Pink Floyd to do cool merch. Like I'm a big fan of uh 70s prog rock um gentle giant yes genesis with peter gabriel king crimson um and when all these pins were like really popular like when like right when people discover like oh shit i can make a pin you know 
when people discovered factories, basically, um, I was like, wait a minute, like I could do pins for bands that I like and I could reach out and I could be like, hey, do you guys need pins for your tour or whatever? And I kind of use that as an advantage of like, you know, I could connect with these bands or I can like, you know, sell legit because you know, I know a lot of these bands, you know, that aren't as big as someone like, you know, Red Hot Chili Peppers or whatever. The money counts and they make a lot of their money through merchandise. And if I see that there's like some, you know, like a pin or whatever, and we could move a bunch of them or whatever, and it helps them out. And I'm like, fuck yeah, you know, and through that. Sorry about that. Uh, I, there's a band called Magma. They're from France. They fucking changed my life. They're fucking awesome. This guy named H.R. Giger, the guy who designed the alien from Aliens, he said that Magma was Magma's music is more intense than the crucifixion of Christ. It's like really crazy shit, right? But it's awesome. It's like this operatic space trippy stuff from the 70s but through that band i was like oh i could do merch i could do all this band stuff and then i jumped off and did some stuff for black sabbath and then black sabbath was putting out a, a dvd and they're like oh could you make pins for our set I'm like fuck yeah i can and then slowly i was like holy shit a lot of these bands because like i said pins were like starting to get real famous and a lot of bands didn't have pins as merch so I fucking jumped on that. I was like, oh, hell yeah, I'll do all these bands. I'll do Reach Out. So I got to do like Pink Floyd. Uh, yeah, Black Sabbath, uh, Megadeth. Um, I had Pink Floyd, David Bowie, a bunch of stuff. And that's kind of how I was like, oh, yeah, rocking pins. I'm the, the rock and roll pin guy. But, uh, but then I, I realized like, holy shit, you know, this is what a company is. You know, you could license stuff. You could, if you want to make merch of something you like, you can, you know, even though I started off as pins, I was like, wait, I, I want to do this other stuff. Then I realized like, wait a minute, I could license the three stooges. I could license Gumby, you know? And I was like, no one's doing this shit. And I grew up loving all that stuff. And, and, and yeah, that's how I started actually, you know, with realizing how to do licensing too. It's like, yeah, how do I get Gumby? Oh, you go to their website and you reach out and, oh, who owns it? Oh, it's his son. And it's just like, I don't know. It's just like this weird, like, world opening thing where you could actually work with, um, you know, something you love. And to me, like having that extra, like, oh, you're working with the family or you're working with the estate or whatever. I don't know. That's kind of cool to me. That's like, oh, yeah, that's like a little, you know what do you call it notch on my belt or whatever i think because i'm all nerdy about like really obscure shit you know betty boop cartoons and uh groucho you Bro, know whatever what an introduction man i love it um just getting right into it just kind of bada bing bada boom there's your 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 origin story you kind of touched upon a lot of things and that's awesome. But uh, my friend, I want to welcome you to the Pin Pals podcast, Mauricio. How's it going? <laughs> pretty good, dude. It's pretty chill. Hell yeah, dude. I love that intro. That There's just, I had so many questions right off the get-go. Um, but before we like kind of dive into all those uh, specifics, um, why don't you tell the listeners a little bit more about yourself? And how you kind of, um, I guess you kind of already did that. I'm trying to think. You 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 pretty much explained, you know, making pins and and um, making pins for bands and stuff like that. And, and it's just, what's the what was like the, the driving force with that? Were you always kind of like a, a creative person? Was that like your you you know your outlet of choice, creating art? Well, I always like art. I'm a big vinyl collector, and I always like, like I said, love music and stuff. And before this, I was working in film production. I used to work for uh, a couple of absolutely production stuff, the Tim and Eric 
world. And then there was also Super Deluxe, which was like an online thing that was putting out also that sort of Tim and Eric sort of stuff. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm from L.A., so I've always loved, you know, my town. And that's sort of the thing I fell into before that. I was like a production assistant on the Bad Girls Club, which is like this reality show with like hood rats and a big mansion and <laughs> that was pretty cool but uh uh yeah just kind of you know my background you know i love comedy music all that sort of stuff but to be honest with the pin stuff like i said it was just an opportunity everybody was making bootleg pins and i knew that like hey you know i knew how bands work and, and merch and all that sort of stuff so i was like yeah if no one's making you know merch of the stuff and then plus two i knew artists who could really get the designs well like i've seen some really weird looking you know pins of, uh, of a, like a real person you know they don't really translate well you got to really get them right and we could do that like we could make a david bowie pin and it looks like david bowie or john <clears throat> john lennon or whatever and uh you know i was just confident like shit they're not you know they love making different merch like you know kiss or whatever and just offer them a pin they bought it you know bands buy tons of merch they buy thousands thousands at a time and then plus two i had a connection um with amoeba records over here in hollywood so they're always buying you know music stuff i mean right now they have a whole section of all pins because of me you know now you could go through cartoons or artists or different genres or whatever but essentially i was there at the right time and I even have uh, the Enamel Pins Instagram account at Enamel Pins. So at that time, oh, that snap. Show, I got it and I was like, oh, yeah, I could like fucking, you know, just promote people and, and just show off all that sort of stuff. And then I think that has like 40,000 plus followers. And then I kind of build that up as well. <laughs> um, but essentially, yeah, it was just like an opportunity to make money. And then once I realized, like, I could use my focus and my money and my attention on stuff that is being forgotten, then that's when I kind of jump started, like, this whole mission of, uh, you know, saving cartoons or doing screenings or, you know, whatever. I, like, at this point, I help manage uh, stuff for the Richard Pryor state. Right now, I'm in the process of, well, I'm doing stuff for the Gumby estate at Gumby Central. Essentially what happened is like earlier this year, the, uh, the Cloakey family sold Gumby to Fox. When Disney bought Fox, they bought all their property. So they bought King of the Hill, Family Guy, you know, all that sort of stuff. What was left over is Fox Entertainment. And then there's also like Fox News and, you know, that's a whole Republican channel. But this Fox Entertainment group, now they're starting to builds up their own properties and they want to start buying up stuff. I just saw an article that King of the Hill is not going to be on the new Fox show because they actually want to own what they're going to put on that channel. But essentially they bought Gumby, you know, Fox owns it now. And then my whole point with that is it's like, Hey, I'm doing screenings. I'm running the Gumby account. There's actually a big fan base of people my age that used to watch Gumby on Nickelodeon. Hell yeah. You know? Right here. And, you know, funny enough, one of the main reasons I'm doing my company is when you go to a convention and you want to sell something, you know, like for me, I have this big Gumby inflatable and most of the time the parents get excited, but then the kids are like, I don't know who that is. Or they're like, they really don't care. And that I think is what's missing. You know, there's that disconnect with this young generation in our generation because the way we saw this stuff was through cassettes or television you know we didn't have internet where we there was just so much you know to to find and because of that disconnect because quite frankly there's because there's so much new stuff and all the parents are like okay we'll just put on whatever is new just to you know get our kid to be quiet or whatever they're missing out on showing them gumby or betty boop or popeye or mighty mouse or, or kind of these uh, classic properties that deserve love and were really awesome at the time. So, you know, I'm still trying to keep that 
connection with people. I'm trying to reintroduce kids and maybe a, a generation forgot it, Gumby or the Fleischer material, you know, whatever. Um, like, I'll give you an example with like Funko. I think what they do is like, cool. I get it. The guy's a big fan of Huckleberry Hounds and the Anna Barbera stuff, but you go up to a kid and you ask him, Hey, do you know, you know, Huckleberry Hound is or Yogi Bear? They're going to be like, no, I don't know who the hell that is. And I get it. The guy's like cool and like he loves it and, and just puts that stuff out there. But I think there needs to be also this push of the cartoons of giving, you know, people context a bit or else it's just going to be forgotten. And then, you know, for example, uh, Mighty Mouse is this Terry Toons character. Terry Toons is kind of like the Viacom version of Looney Tunes. It's got Heckle and Jekyll and um, Deputy Dog and all this sort of stuff. All those films are still in a vault. They haven't been scanned or restored or anything like that. And that's because they think, you know, there's no interest or nobody cares. And what I'm trying to do is basically build up that interest, show these companies that, you know, there is, there are people that want to see this stuff. Um, for like the Richard Pryor stuff. I mean, he's the damn king of comedy, especially how popular comedy podcasts are now with Joe Rogan or whatever. And, um, and to hear that a lot of people don't know who Richard Pryor is, it's like, like what? Like you have to. And that's why I'm putting on his shows. I'm putting on his movies and putting on his concerts and showing that stuff out there. But essentially my company is just to show off, you know, stuff I grew up loving, kind of keep this stuff alive, just get people interested and in, in loving this stuff all over again. Um, yeah, I love it. You're, you're, you're really, uh, and in my head, you know, I'm, I'm thinking this kid's building, I, I don't mean the kid, but you know, this dude is building a bridge, like this gap between like this old school into a new era. Cause there's so much content being put out there now. And a lot of it's just getting put in the back burner, forgotten with just how much like new stuff is being spit out. So it's kind of cool that you're giving, uh, this kind of platform, this aesthetic, these, these old cartoons, um, like a platform to still like breathe and, and alive and attract a new audience. Like I'm a big Gumby fan. I definitely grew up watching Gumby. It's got the stuffed animals, had the action figures and stuff like that. I actually did a um, Ninja Turtle Gumby mashup with one of my buddies, um, the Real Meep, a couple years ago. But um, but that's really cool, man. I, I'm I'm loving what you're doing. I you know I've been following you for a couple years. This has been really cool. I'm. Um, when did you? When did you start kind of uh, like rocking pins? Uh, 2017. 2017. So it's a different world that, back then, right? Well, honestly, I think maybe like 2015, 2016, because 2017 is when I uh, made my company, but I was probably doing some stuff before then. But yeah, around that time is when people really got excited about pins and stuff. Do you remember um, what your first pin is? Uh, yeah, it was the uh, Magma pin, the, that the band. Magma pin? It was like their logo. It's like this golden one. And then I started doing like, uh, seeing if I could, because that's the thing in the beginning, you know, you got to test things out, see if you can create stuff, recreate stuff. So I was doing like band stuff. That way I could take photos and then show the bands like, hey, look, I could do this, you know? Um but yeah, I was doing mostly like band stuff. But the trick is like is to make sure you make pins that don't look bootleg. Because that's the thing. A lot of these pins, you know, it's funny, you know, yeah, people are still making bootlegs, but they should invest in making them not look like bootlegs. Because a lot of the time they just like do these weird redraws and they don't really invest into like, hey, it's actually supposed to look like the Aerosmith logo or whatever. Um so that was my trick in the beginning is actually figuring out, make it look legit, you know, and then I could like reach out to the bands or else, you know, they're not going to fucking buy them. Well, yeah, of <laughs> course, you know, you're going to need like a, a good product. And, you know, when you got, I, I guess, uh, bootlegs out in the market, you know, it's uh, it shouldn't be that hard to make something looking a little bit better, getting the colors right or, or, or something like that. And that's the thing, too, is like if you can make something that's even better than their official stuff. They'll love it even more. And that way you can even branch out and do your own business 
like I'm sure a lot of people are that have their little touch of, you know, what makes them special. But, you know, that's the cool thing about it is you, you can experiment. You can do a couple of bootlegs here and there to see how things work. And then once you figure it out, you could fucking reach out. And that's the thing. <clears throat> I want people to know you could totally reach out and, and work with these companies. It's totally easy. There's usually this licensing expo in Vegas, uh, which is like kind of fun to check out, you know, if you can do it, of course. But if you can't, there's a lot of this information you could find online. Or, you know, you can hit me up if you need help with finding out who to contact. But it, that's the cool thing about licensing is you can make deals with a lot of people that you like and, you know, want to work with. I know Ninja Turtles, though, Viacom bought them. Sadly, Vi Viacom, that's one of the reasons why I didn't resign because I had Beavis and Butthead and, and Daria with them. They want like a, a lot of money. I can't afford it. <laughs> but they just, uh, there was a lot of mergers that happened these last couple of years. They just merged with Paramount, CBS. Yep. So they want, yeah, like a good couple grand for Ninja Turtles. But the thing is, though, if you, if you can get a deal, you could get it at low at the minimum that they want but you could also make sure to add in a couple other shows so if, don't just get ninja turtles also get you know rugrats or real monsters or ren and stimpy oh and I think like they a got three Garfield. for one four for one kind of deal exactly because uh for example with fox this is before disney bought them i just want a king of the hill so i got king of the hill just that property and i paid Ten thousand for it, but to re-sign with Disney, they wanted me to add more properties. But to be honest with you, I didn't want any Disney stuff. You know, it's just like oversaturated. Like, what am I going to do? P like Disney pins. Like, yeah, sure, I'll <laughs> I'll start making Disney pins. Like, that's market's been taken over already. Like, people are already buying Disney pins. Like, what am I going to do? There's bootlegs so, uh, of the bootlegs in the Disney world. It's it runs that deep. <laughs> I saw an article that some dudes were making Disney bootlegs. Like they were getting them from Chinese factories and the FBI like raided their house. Like that shit scared me <laughs> completely because they were, Hey, they were making bank. Like that's the thing is like, they were ordering them by the thousands. I think that's why, you know, they got caught. Cause like, you know, obviously the, um, the people checking the stuff they see, there's like, you know, a thousand whatever mickey mouse or goofy stuff obviously they're gonna tip off the cops but that shit totally scared me off from doing anything disney related but um but no yeah <clears throat> that's a tip if anybody wants to license and you think like oh i should i really want ninja turtles and it's too much money like bundle that shit get garfields get you know ren and stimpy um they'll even give you access to the other stuff mtv paramount which has like Godfather, Cheech and Chong. Yeah, they got so much. They're they're gobbling up content and IPs. Um, but I do have a couple questions about this. So since you started talking about it, what are some of the like pros and cons to uh, working with these licensed IPs or going after these licenses? Like, does it really make an impact when you can say uh, these pins are officially licensed? Like, uh, talk to me about that. Well, yeah, let's say, you know, you want to sell, I don't know, let's say you have uh, Ren and Stimpy or Mickey Mouse, right? And once you have official stuff, you can be able to sell at Target. You can go to, you know, a local store and, and you know, sell your pins at wholesale and get your stuff out there, more out there, especially if you want to have a name brand. You want to be in more stores, you know, you want to be able to be, you know, eventually at, at a Hot Topic or whatever. They're not going to buy bootlegs. You know, yeah, you can make bootlegs if you just want to sell 100 or whatever. And you go to conventions and obviously you can, you know, sell them that way. But if you really want to make a name for yourself and you, you want to expand your brand, you know, do it officially. You can do also, you know, limited edition stuff still. You could do... Uh, stuff where you could sell at like GameStop or, you know, Target or, or whatever. That's Those companies want that. They'll pay extra for that sort of limited edition stuff. But 
uh, just getting your, your mind clear of like, oh, I'm going to get shut down or, or whatever. And also, you know, the opportunities, like I said, you'll be able to expand and get into stores. I'll be able to buy them by the thousands, you know, um, that means just more money for you. And it's not like a lot of these companies take, oh, they're going to take 50% or whatever. You can, dude, they could take like, I don't know, like from 10%, 12%, you know, which is like not that much, really. The only thing is like, yeah, you have to pay in advance. You got to come in already. You got to have like insurance, business insurance, all that sort of stuff. Um, but like I said, if this is the business that you want to get into and be able to grow and like, yeah, have your merch sold everywhere then that's that's where you know you can go into that way and then also you could expand and kind of do other stuff as well not just with like you know viacom if that's your thing then you could also jump on and maybe do some other maybe some other brand wants to work with you they say hey we love the stuff that you did with them we want to do something with you um it's sort of that way that avenue obviously i know a lot of artists like to do kind of not, they're not bootlegs, but they're kind of artist, what do you call it, like renditions or something like that. I think that's more of a different sort of thing. They can totally do official stuff, but then they could also do stuff just like on their own. Obviously, they're not trying to trademark in fringe or they're not, you know, using Mickey's full face. I've seen stuff, you know, where they cover his face or, you know, it's just like altered a bit or whatever. And a lot of these brands now are starting to reach out to those artists and saying, hey, let's collab and do something. Because it's kind of that streetwear sort of vibe that they're trying to reach out to, which is funny considering now, you know, we always thought that these business people were like old school or whatever. Now they're starting to hire like young people to do these designer vinyl collectibles or do designer collabs and all this sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, you know. It's just, like I said, if you see that there's nobody else doing pins that you're doing, if there's, you know, if Nickelodeon is putting stuff out, but it's like really whack and it's like, why don't you make stuff that, you know, fans really want? If you know that fans really want that and they really want to pay that much money, jump in there and you be the one to make that, you know, officially and be the one to feed that stuff in there. Then that way you'll know that the fans will support you because they'll see that you're a true fan you're making the shit that they want and it's official. Like that's even more because then that way Nickelodeon would see like, Hey, this is the brand that gets it. This, these are the type of brands that we want around. Then they start buying your stuff. They start wanting to have your stuff at the official TMNT store and, you know, build that sort of thing. There's a lot of opportunities that can arise from that sort of route. If people take it. Um, but yeah, you know, with me, it's just like, it's getting me to work with, like I said, the Richard Pryor state. And then I could do stuff like do official screenings or do official Gumby, whatever. It just opens up opportunities to you to work with the official owners and be able to hopefully do cool stuff like that. Oh man. I love it. Do you have a favorite, um, like IP that you like working with a favorite property? Well, the main one that I'm really focusing on right now, are the uh, Fleischer Studios cartoons, which are the Popeye, Superman, Betty Boop, Coco the Clown. You know, I'm even trying to do figures. <laughs> oh, you're making figures too. You're getting into that? Yeah, so... That's awesome. So a couple years ago, there was this video by a rapper named Ghost Main, and the video part of it is the sequence of Betty Boop Snow White, where it has uh, Coco the Clown being rotoscoped. And they rotoscope Cap Calloway and he's dancing. Then he turns into a ghost. It's like, here's one of our shirts. <laughs> but that sequence, because it's got like the dancing ghost and everything, it's got like 400 million plus views on this like 30 second clip. And a lot of these like younger kids like think Ghost Main has something to do with that video. It's, it was actually a fan video, but now people are getting tattoos of Coco. They're getting tattoos of the ghost. And I was asking the, the owners of the uh, the Fleischer license at the time. I was like, hey, we're, how come you guys don't do merch of Coco the Clown? Or, or where's all the cartoons? Because their bread and butter is Betty Boop. Like, that's all they were you know, focusing on. So I said, like, where's all this material? And they're like, oh, 
you know, whatever. I wasn't getting anywhere with them. And then I reached out to Max Fleischer's granddaughter, who's part of the Fleischer board. And she was like, yeah, I, you know, he had a series. This was before Betty Boop of Coco the Clown. And we got together and we started locating this stuff and then started, you know, restoring it. And then we started going in further and saying, hey, where are the Betty Boop stuff? Or where are the other cartoons that are, that were made? So now we're working together to get all this material out. The Fleischer cartoons are amazing. They were around um, before Disney was out. You know, they were Disney's biggest rival. Um, oh, that I right, didn't know. But right now, yeah, that's what I'm focused on is saving all of those cartoons, presenting them in, in like a theater. Um, you know, just getting the word out there for, for this stuff. It's like, you know, it's like if Disney, you know, was just selling Mickey stuff without the cartoons. People need to see this stuff. And then like I, back to my first point with growing up with this stuff, as I've been showing the Fleischer cartoons, people are getting reminded, they're getting these nostalgia trips of like, oh, I used to watch this. You know, there's Popeye meets Aladdin or Popeye meets Sinbad or the Alibaba one. And that stuff is amazing. The Superman cartoons are so awesome. We did a tweet. I think it's got like 5 million views now just on this small little Superman segment. But yeah, right now I'm just like focusing on saving those cartoons, putting on shows. Um, I put on the events uh, locally in LA. I post them on our Instagram mostly, which is the rock and pins Instagram. But yeah, that stuff is amazing, especially on a big screen and 4k, you know, and that's what I want to do with the Gumby stuff too. I want to rescan the Gumby material in 4k Hopefully put that on the big screen because yeah, that those fifties Gumby shorts are so trippy. They're it's awesome. they're incredible. I remember uh like in college I I finally I got back into Gumby, but like appreciating it from like an artistic standpoint, just being like this stop motion. I can't imagine how long it took and stuff like that. And the pilot, Gumbasia. I thought was like the coolest thing ever. So if 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 I'm all in favor of uh, getting like 4K resolution Gumby videos out there, let me know what I got to do to help out with that. But that's uh, but that's pretty cool. Just keeping all this this art, this culture uh, alive th- through the brand, and you know, uh, it looks like you're doing really well. Uh, you, you, it looks like you have a community just kind of like looking through your Instagram. You're sharing a lot of nostalgia stuff. And like you said, nostalgia does uh, hit pretty hard. Do you have any do you have any like horror stories or have hit any challenges when working with uh, some of these licensed characters or maybe like limitations? Like maybe you're not allowed to depict uh gumby smoking a joint or something like that yeah they, there are some rules like that um where you know obviously you can't have you know betty boob naked or you know doing something weird or whatever um thankfully you know i'm not i don't really want to do stuff like that in terms of like horror stories i mean um not really i can't think of anything too bad there's this I'll say about one thing that's kind of funny. There's like, cause there is a cartoon community. There's a community already, you know, that collects film prints and, and they love cartoons or big nerds about Looney Tunes and all that sort of stuff. But I didn't know that there was like a community like that. And, and they're really intense and they really love this stuff. And there was a guy in the East coast, you know, he was a big, he collects film and he has his Blu-ray, uh, company and stuff like that and and whatever and he was he's a big uh silent cartoon guy that's his that's his whole thing and these coco cartoons because they're silent you know it kind of falls in his territory i mean he's been uh scanning because he owns them and he collects them and that sort of stuff and he includes some of them but we were cool and all but then when we were like with me and jane Fleischer we're like hey now we want to kind of like scan this can we work with you can we you know let's work together he like fucking flipped out and fucking was like has been so vicious to like what we're doing and it's funny like I have some rival some cartoon rival in New York uh, that's been kind of yeah 
an online fucking weirdo. And that's the only <laughs> like, negative thing I could think of right now. Um, Cause what sucks is he's got clout. I mean, you know, I respect him. He, you know, he was there before me. I'm not trying to take his job or anything like that. If anything, I want to help out the family. You know, if it's family asking for the material, I mean, you've got to go like, dude, come on. Like it's the f- granddaughter. Like you can't just like hoard this stuff for yourself. Help us out. You know, but just the way this guy's been acting has been just such a bummer. And uh, um, yeah, I, I just say, just like watch out for those cartoon Looney Tune fucking people. Cause they're fucking crazy. Um, but no, other than that, not really. I mean, it's, it's all every day is like a, a different goal. You know, I think what's cool about this, it allows me to try out different stuff. You know, I never screened stuff before. So, it, so with this, it gives me a challenge of, you know, okay, where do I find places to screen at? How do I screen material or what do I do? Um, if anything, it helps me reach out and make connections with people and, and, you know, try to do new events and figure out what's the next thing we could celebrate. Um, I'm trying to uh, do an Andy Kaufman celebration thing. I'm, I work with his uh, his nephew and he's somebody that I think, you know, should be acknowledged and maybe given some love this time around. And uh, But yeah, you know, it's fun just creating different events or thinking up the next thing that I want to show off. It's just fun. It's just like finding something cool and showing it to your friends, really. Um, and then the pin stuff is just helps fund it to be honest with you it's fun to make pins but i'd rather just go and show cool stuff keep that alive and yeah i'll sell a thing or two and if it makes people happy great but you know it's just keeping this alive you know yeah oh man i dig that (laughs) it's so cool man we have nothing fun like that out here in jersey i feel like all that that cool I don't know if obscure, I don't, I'm not trying to, you know, uh, uh, say anything bad or, or use that in, in like a negative way, but like you're not going to find like a lot of these old cartoons or you're not going to find folks, you know, screening old cartoons or, you know, trying to trying to find like a cartoon community, I feel like isn't, it, it, it runs deep, but it's also, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just really cool. It's just what I'm trying to say. You know, it seems like a really cool community. I think you have to create it yourself. If you, there's nobody making it, you know, if yeah. you know, the theater, if you know, there's like a local screening area or whatever, just rent it out, get the word out there, you know, pass out flyers or, or, you know, do some sort of local sharing event. Like for example, since you're really into Ninja Turtles, you could either have, a screening of the first film or the second film or do back to back, or you could do a screening of the cartoons. I've never seen that before. That's actually something that I've been trying to do is screen TV shows or screen some sort of stuff. Like I want to screen maybe like Pee Wee's Playhouse a couple episodes, but like with people and kind of see how that goes. But to have like a screening of maybe like, you know, the four best, uh, Ninja Turtle episodes and then you know have pizza there or maybe have somebody um, from the show or, or have one of the creators do a QA and a or something but like to have cool niche events like that especially if it's kind of this nostalgia thing where like hey everyone's going to sit down and watch you know four episodes of the cartoon people would totally love that um, and that's kind of my thinking is like how can I create like a cool fun event where it's like half nostalgia and also half uh, kind of history lesson. That's an important thing about me is give people context. If I'm going to have an event about the Fleischer cartoons or Gumby, you know, give people context and give people some history on that sort of stuff. But, um, the, you know, the interest is there. You just like just create it, get it out there. And uh, I think people definitely show up. Hell yeah. I love it. How do you stay inspired like, do you, you just constantly watching cartoons and coming up with ideas? Like, because you seem like a really creative uh, go-getter. Like, you're you're getting stuff done. You know how to network. You're establishing these relationships. So what what's the fuel behind the fire? Uh, I think just getting people interested to show something. Like, if I showed you, like, a new song or a cartoon and you get really, like, excited about it and, I, and it's because of me or something you know it's like you're showing a friend something cool and they they also like it like that feeling is what drives me 
And if I could do that, like times a thousand or whatever, even better, especially like online, you could just share stuff. But because of the material that I'm working on, a lot of it hasn't been restored. So it's like we're it's a process of finding the material, you know, taking screenshots, showing how it's being restored or cleaned up. So it's kind of slowly being, you know, shared. So I have so much of that, whether it's the Fleischer stuff, the Gumby stuff, uh, the Richard Pryor stuff. And it's kind of like we're all learning together since, you know, a lot of people haven't seen a lot of the Gumby episodes. I have all the episodes, so I rewatch them. I actually do live streams or live streams on Gumby Central. I play, you know, random episodes. So as I'm doing that, I screen cap, you know, little scenes or do this and that. I put that on the Instagram. So it's kind of like I'm always mining for different material different cartoons, different scenes, because I have to keep all the social media, you know, active. Yeah. Oh, so, snap. Are, are you running Gumby Central? Yeah, because when I first got it, it was like last year, there was like 2000 followers. And I was like, wait a minute, like you guys can like post stuff and get, you know, a following. And then I got their contact info and I just started doing it myself. Um, and Fox likes it. Like they're still keeping me around. They're like, hey. At first, we didn't know what was up with you because, you know, who's this guy screening our material? But then it's like, no, we get it, which is great. You know, I'm the bridge. I'm getting people interested in old Gumby and then leads them on to new Gumby with whatever, you know, they end up doing. Dude, this is amazing. I, I, I want to grab my Gumby figure, but you're just going to have uh, a weird shot of my crotch when I reach up all the way up there. But I also have up there a, uh, a bootleg Gumby. I went to the show and see on this table these things that look like Gumby. But when I get closer, he, this dude calls him Fumby. And yeah. it's very similar. Uh, I don't know if you've if heard of it before. But he's got like little nipples. He's got a little butt. Uh, <laughs> it's just like really fun just kind of paying homage to, to Gumby. But that's really cool. So like... Uh, Fox has you like also part of like these deals like running these social media accounts or is this like just because you love the the, the property so much well I'm a licensee and right now yeah because I'm like the only one kind of being actively on there <laughs> they're letting me do it so because um, that's the thing too is I don't want some big company to come in and then they just start posting like weird you know stuff that's not has nothing to do with Gumby that's like not in the Gumby world you know I think what's cool is just just to post screenshots there's a Twitter account that has like I think 40,000 followers it's just all Gumby screenshots <laughs> up to the guy um, and yeah essentially I just get shots from there put in a caption and people love it you know just give them what they want they just want more Gumby and, and pokey so Dude, Gumby and Pokey, I love it. No, that's really cool, and and I think you're you're touching on a sentiment here, which I think you talked about before, but just we're fans making stuff for other fans, and I think that's you know when these big corporations or companies see that kind of stuff, those are the people that they should be like leaning into, and that you know it's pretty much what you're doing, so that's pretty cool, dude. So, yeah, I'm just trying to keep that stuff alive. You know, it's fun. I love it. If someone came up to you and they wanted to make pins, uh, what advice would you give them? or What kind of guidance would you share with them? I'd give them the email to my manufacturer. Just be like, look, here you go. There it is. Uh, no, but but yeah, if anything, I'd, I'd hook them up with like a good uh, artist pin artist because that's the important thing is you got to find someone who could do a really cool design of what you want because um that's what's important and then i'd probably just like guide them and you know let them know like uh the right metals and all that sort of stuff i'd say always use two pin backs because you never know if you lose one of the backings you could still have the other and usually with the one pin backings they spin also i would say is if you're going to sell a pin for 10 bucks, make it at least like an inch and a half um, in size or bigger. Usually it's not too um, expensive, but it's just, I see that people are like, 
you know, oh, I don't want to spend 10 bucks for a small little pin or whatever. Um, I don't think people do small pins anymore. Sometimes they do. But, uh, but yeah, it's not that difficult anymore. That's the thing about the internet. Now you could figure out how to manufacture anything online. It's really easy. Just, yeah. go on you- Just go on YouTube. There's so much stuff out there. Um, so it's pretty cool. Yeah. So like, you know, all that content out there, all that educational content, all those resources, there really isn't an excuse, you know, nowadays to like learn how to, to, to make pins. But, you know, there's always holdups and stuff like that. And it's, it's always a, a validating thing when you can reach out to like another pin maker, uh, and talk and share and, and, you know, just kind of, um, pass the torch so to speak to someone else uh looking to get into the game but that's pretty cool do you have any uh cartoons that our viewers should check out aside from the stuff that you mentioned so i just scanned this 16 millimeter print of the mad magazine tv special um which essentially in the 70s they try to translate the mad magazine over to you know an animated show my friend, Mark Kausler, who animated on Who Framed Roger Rabbit, he did the animation for Tweety and Droopy in the movie. He animated the Spy vs. Spy segment on this. And aside from that, there's also like a Godfather parody and there's a couple other fun stuff in there. But I just uploaded that. I scanned it um, with the help of Blackhawk Films and Burbank. They scanned it to 2K. That's on my Rockin' Pins YouTube channel. And I have a lot of other cartoons on there if people want to check it out. I have Felix the Cat. I have some Mutt and Jeff, which is another series I'm working on saving. They're, they're hilarious. But um, but yeah, if you want to see more cartoons, it's at Rockin' Pins YouTube. And you can yeah. see that on there. Uh, um, I did see a Mutt and Jeff Kickstarter uh, on your uh, the link in the bio. It's got uh, your link tree. has got a bunch of like different links. Uh, and that looks like it was like a recent project so and you just talked about that so tell me a little bit more about that kickstarter project sounds pretty cool essentially mutt and jeff were like the first really big famous uh comic characters not in a comic book but like a newspaper comic they were created by bud fisher like you know almost like a hundred years already but they were like the most popular comic strip characters and they had an animated series i think they had like over 200 or 500 cartoons from the 1908 to like 1920s or whatever. but like pretty much all that stuff is like either forgotten or just neglected and it's just weird to think about that there was these two characters that were just super popular and then just forgotten i know in the uh, 90s there was one cartoon of theirs where they were like cowboys and that was in a lot of the public domain cassettes that's how I remember them. Um, but as I like watch this stuff, I was like, wait a minute, this is hilarious. Like, that's the thing. If, if it was just like some lame old cartoon, I was like, eh, whatever. But they're hilariously, hilariously just made so creative. Um, essentially, I just teamed up with a buddy of mine, Brandon, who also restores cartoons. Like, that's our thing now. I'm obsessed with like finding cartoon prints, scanning them you know, getting them in 4K, 2K, whatever. So we're getting material from the Library of Congress, uh, the George Eastman House, the the BFI, the British Film Institute. um, And we're scanning and restoring the Mutt and Jeff cartoons. We're going to put them on Blu-ray. And uh, funny enough, they're still owned by this comic syndicate. So, uh, you know, I got the official license to make Birch and I'm kind of using that to fund it and um, but yeah, there's like a bunch of old just material and comics and cartoons and all this sort of stuff that's still amazingly funny. But, you know, as things move on, just it get, they get forgotten. There was even like a robot chicken skit about Mutt and Jeff where like they come out and they're like, we're Mutt and Jeff. We've been <laughs> forgotten. Save us. And, you know, so I like reached out to Seth Green. I was like, can you help us out? But he ignored me. But whatever. <laughs> but what? uh I, I got to ask, what's um, what's your approach to to networking or trying to make these opportunities like happen? You know, you you make it the way you you're saying these is just like, oh, I just reached out to the Cloaky family, 
like what does it take what's your secret what's the secret sauce to like making these 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 networks happen these connections happen well if you really like this stuff i mean they'll tell right away i mean you could just be friendly and just say hey i really like this i think this is awesome and i want to help you know you just as long as they see that you're interested in what they make and that you just want to help or you just want to assist or you know that's pretty much it. I mean, it's just the love for this stuff, you know. They'll they'll tell right away if you're being fake, I guess. But uh, I don't know. It's just the excite, like I said, the excitement of getting more people into what you're into, and then plus two because I'm not really going for the mainstream mainstream stuff. I'm not going for like Rick and Morty or Disney or whatever. I see that there's these properties that are kind of small now but they still have like this loving loving fan base and because they're not talked about that much and because you're the only one talking about it i don't know maybe you get more attention that way too Hmm. um because i don't think anybody else is really talking about gumby or the fleischer stuff at the moment um but i don't know yeah just love the stuff that you're into and just if you know your shit, then that's, you know, they're going to tell, they're going to be like, yeah, this guy knows what's up and we want to work with him. Um, but that's yeah. true. They're, they'd probably be quick to pick up whether or not you're like full of BS. Um, oh man. I just had a thought, like how amazing would it be if we had like a Gumby animated series, like done in like today's style? That's what they're trying to do. So we'll see. Oh, interesting. Oh, Pin Pals exclusive. Burr, burr, burr. Um, I got to ask you, are there any new cartoons that you're into right now? Uh, Smiling Friends was really awesome. <laughs> yes, uh, yo, I saw that too. Uh, I think they fun. had a panel on. Um, that's all I can think of, to be honest with you. I mean... If anything, I'm just kind of looking for older stuff. That's the thing about the Fleischer stuff, too. There's a lot of stuff that hasn't been seen or it's in crappy quality. So that's the hunt, too. The the, the kind of draw to this stuff is you're on a mission to see this and, you know. But, but yeah, that's all I can think of right now. The Smiling Friends is really funny. No, no, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that character Pim and uh, Mr. Frog and all that stuff, that was pretty wild. I would recommend watching the Popeye stuff, the Fleischer ones, the black and white ones, that stuff is so hilarious. I don't think a lot of people have seen them since they were kids. Like they were not made for children. Like they were adult cartoons and they're so funny, but sadly they're, they've been taken out of HBO max. I think the only way to watch them now is through boomerang. But if you can watch if, through boomerang, I'd say go ahead. Cause they're hilarious. Hell yeah. We'll have to check that out. Yeah, I'm looking through your YouTube page right now. Just subscribed. Uh, and I'm going to mark the the Felix the Cat video to watch for later. I used to watch that shit as a kid. I love it. Um, all right, man. Well, we're pretty much at the end of the podcast. I like to, to end things with the uh, this question. Mauricio, what are the little things in life for you? Or the, you mean pins or what? Do you, <laughs> uh, you know what? Like, it's like, it's just keeping this stuff alive, man. You know, my, my dad passed away a couple years ago and he's the one who introduced me to all this material. And I know a lot of these cartoons mean a lot to people. And that's the driving force really behind this is, you know, when you watch a cartoon, when you were growing up, you think about your parents or your grandparents or someone you, you love watching this stuff. And, and that's the cool thing about this is getting people uh, you know, re- reconnected with something that they love and something that they grew up watching. So it's just, you know, uh, sharing that stuff to people is what makes me happy, you know, getting people, you know, reminding themselves of, of happier times, you know, especially right now, it feels like people want a lot of comfort media and stuff like that. So if I can offer this, I can keep it alive, then that's great. You know, we just want to make sure people uh, don't forget this awesome stuff. So, yeah, just keeping it alive. That's what it's all about, you know? I love it. I think you're doing a great job. And uh, you've definitely earned, like, another supporter. You know, as whatever I can do to help with, like, the Gumby stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah. Let, let me know. Um, 
But it's been an absolute pleasure uh, getting to talk with you, getting to, you know, tap into your expertise, into your world and, and understand your approach to pins and everything. Um, I'd love to give you the floor if you have any shout outs or want to let the people know where they can find you on the web or on Instagram. Go ahead. Yeah, so I think right now our latest viral thing is our AR filter of Coco the Ghost, that thing I was talking about earlier. I'll show people real quick. I think people have been seeing this on Instagram a lot. That's ours. That's on Fleischer Tunes. And if, yeah, if you want to see more clips and more just images of Fleischer stuff, go to there, Fleischer Tunes. My main account is Rockin' Pins. I post everything that I work on there. And then also I have uh, Gumby Central. So if you like Gumby, go there. And if you like Richard Pryor, go to at Richard Pryor, also run that. But uh, yeah, whatever you like, check it out, you know, just keep it alive. Hell yeah. I love it. A man of many hats. This is pretty cool. Easy. No, it's 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 definitely not easy. So, uh, you know, when you were just spitting out one Instagram account after another, I'm like, this guy, this guy knows the definition of hustling. Because I'm sure there's so many moving pieces, you know, for each, uh, for each license that you have, and um, you've got fourteen thousand sales on your Etsy page. So I'm sure, you know, you're staying busy. So that's cool, man. I appreciate your time. Thanks for for being here. Um, hopefully, you know, next time I'm back on the West Coast, I'd love to to link up and maybe you know go to one of your events have some beer, watch some old cartoons and just kick it for sure, dude. Thank you again. I appreciate it. Thank yeah. you so much. No problem, man. We'll talk real soon. I'll talk to you later, man. Bye. Peace. <laughs>